so yes, I am here today to talk to you about the career as an x-ray technologist. So I'll be giving you some background on what it is to be an x-ray tech, what you need to do to become one, and the different areas of where you could be working one day if you do take the program. So who here has had an x-ray? There's always a big show of hands. How about a CT scan? How about an MRI? Ultrasound? Okay. So an x-ray technologist is a person who takes images of the inside of your body, whether it's the bones, your organs, blood vessels, all different types of procedures that we can do to visualize what we can't see with the naked eye. Okay? So this is an image of a wrist. Some of you who have had x-ray may have done this and broken your wrist, snowboarding, skateboarding, very common injuries. Very common injury for those types of um, sports or activities. An x-ray technologist would have been the person who took the images for your doctor so that he could see how badly it's broken, where it's broken, to put on the cast to fix it. Do I have to actually point this here? There we go. Okay, this is an image of a fluoroscopic study, which is an image of the organs on the inside. So this is the stomach and the first, smart of your, first part of your small bowel. So an x-ray technologist would also be involved in a study. For example, if you go to the doctor, you have a sore stomach, you don't know why. They might be sending you to us to drink. Has anybody had that special drink where they had kind of chalky liquid? Okay, well what it does is it actually allows us to visualize your stomach, large bowel, small bowel, on x-ray to see if there's something going on that the doctor needs to fix to make you feel better. An x-ray technologist can also be a mammographer or do mammograms, which is specialized imaging of the breast. So if any, anyone here has a, um, a mother or sister, aunt, grandmother who has a history of breast cancer, definitely they have had a mammogram done and some of them may have had them done without having cancer just to check to see for baseline examinations. And that would have been done as well by an x-ray technologist. CT scan. X-ray technologist also does CT scanning. So if you've been involved in a car accident, is a very common um, type of event that we would be doing CT scanning for so that we can see what has been damaged internally. We also take specialized imaging of the vessels in the body, the blood vessels, the arteries, veins, heart, and an x-ray technologist would also be involved in those types of studies. As well, some x-ray technologists go on to become MRI technologists, and they could be taking MRI, that's an MRI of the brain, or they can go on to ultrasound, and they could be doing images of the unborn child of the expected parents. So before I get into about the career and what we do on a daily basis, I'm going to give you just a little bit of background of how I got to where I am today, because I know that's where all of you are starting from, or most of you. So way back in time, in 1989, I graduated from high school from Windsor Park Collegiate. Is there anybody here from Windsor Park? No? Oh, yay, Windsor Park. Go Royals. Okay. 1989 to 1981, I went to University of Manitoba for two years. Kind of was feeling everything out, wasn't sure what I wanted to do, so I decided after two years, university just wasn't for me. It's not that it's not for everybody, for everybody, just not for me. From 1991 to 93, I was a work in progress, trying to figure out what it was I wanted to do with my life. And believe it or not, I actually went to a similar type of career symposium and discovered that this is where I wanted to be, was an x-ray technologist. So I went to Red River College for two years, from 93 to 95. From 95 to 2000, I worked at various clinics in the city, rural hospitals, doing some casual work. Had, one, had my first child during that time. And then from 2000 until now, I've been at the Health Sciences Center here in Winnipeg for 13 years. And now, for, at the beginning of that, I was a, a general duty x-ray technologist working in the general imaging department, which is where we do hands, wrists, chest x-rays, etc. And I did that for eight years before I became the clinical education coordinator or, easier way, clinical instructor for the department. So what are the daily routines and responsibilities of 
this occupation or the occupation of an x-ray tech. So we're responsible to explain the procedure to the patient. So when they come in, depending on what it is that their doctor has ordered, it's up to us to explain to them exactly what we're going to be doing that day, whether it's specialized, a simple chest x-ray, a simple hand x-ray. We still have to tell the patient what it is we're going to be doing that day. Oops, sorry. Answer questions as fully as possible, which also falls into contribute to patient education. So anytime a patient has a question for us, or a doctor or a nurse or anyone who's working in the hospital may be asking, how much radiation is too much? Is it safe for me to be this close? Because radiation can be dangerous if we're not using it properly. That's part of your training. When you're learning it in school, you're taught what is safe, what isn't, and how to keep everybody else safe. So on a daily basis, we're always answering those types of questions. Comfort patients and provide emotional support. A lot of the patients that we see have just been in a major car accident. Or maybe they just found out they had cancer. Or maybe their family member is the one who's really, really ill and they're there supporting them. So it's up to us to keep, to be, when we're in the rooms with those patients and with those family members, that we're providing that emotional support to them and making them feel comfortable when they're with us. Position patients and equipment correctly. So every body part, has a special image that we can take of it, and we have to position the patient into different, um, sometimes it looks like it's you know, extremely difficult for the patient to do those positions for us, uh, but we try our best to explain it to them and help them in every way possible to get them into the position we need to get the right images for the doctor. So for example, a hand, there's three basic images that we do. Most of the time, most of the time it's, sim it's simple, but when you break that hand, it's not that easy. It's a little bit more painful. Or your leg is broken, or your pelvis is broken, so, or your spine is broken. Okay, so sometimes we have to alter how we do things to make it comfortable. Ensure patients, staff, and visitors are protected from radiation. So only person who's allowed into the room is the patient when we're actually taking the x-ray. Family members are not usually allowed in unless it's a child and we need the parent to stay with the child in the room. In those cases, or we sometimes have to stay with the patients in the room depending on the procedure that we're doing. So yes, as x-ray techs, we do get exposed. However, we do take precautions. We wear lead shielding, we wear those heavy lead vests you see people walking around in sometimes. Yes, they are heavy, but there's different variations of them to make it more comfortable for us on a daily basis to wear them. As well, all the walls in the department are lined with lead. So those people sitting out in the waiting room are not at risk. The technologist who is going to take the picture that goes to stand behind the wall is not at risk. Okay? Monitor patients during the procedure. Patient status can change. Patient is a critical patient. We have to monitor, keep an eye on them. So I've had patients faint on me in the room. They walk into the room, they stand up, they go to take that x-ray. I walk away for two seconds and all of a sudden the patient's doing this. I have to keep my eye on them at all times. In that case, it's my job to run into the room, bring them down to the floor in a safe manner, and call a code so that I can get help. That's just an example. It doesn't happen every day. Don't worry. It's just an example to know that you always have to keep your eyes on your patient. Assist the radiologist for angiographic and interventional procedures. So that one image that I showed you earlier that had the vessels, the blood vessels, those, those are actually performed by a radiologist who is a specialized physician in doing these types of procedures as well as reading the x-rays that we take. We are there to assist them. We assist them with prepping the tray. It's a sterile procedure. It's almost like an OR. We prep the tray. We take the images. But they're the ones actually doing the procedure with the patient. And of course, we operate the equipment. Um, different styles of equipment, depending on the type of procedure do you're doing. If it's a interventional suite, like I just explained, it's much different equipment than the one you would use in the room that we take a simple hand x-ray. So you have to learn all the different types of equipment, or CT scanner, different types of equipment. So these are just a couple of images of a general x-ray room and a couple of examples of a patient being in that room with a technologist. So the first image is actually a technologist positioning a patient for a chest x-ray. And the second one is, a, is an image of a, of a technologist positioning a patient for an abdomen x-ray. So you can see sometimes we have them standing. Sometimes the patients are lying down. Sometimes we have them sitting at the end of that table to just put their hand out for us. Okay. This is a CT scanner. So it's still an x-ray machine, but it's much different. That table that the patient is lying on moves in and out. Okay. Those of you who have had a CT scan know what that's all about. You lie down, they zoom you into this big donut, take the pictures, zoom you back out, and say, you're all done. 
takes about five minutes depending on what kind of 20, five to 15 minutes depending on what kind of scan you're having done. This is a mammography unit, so those specialized images for the, for the breast, those patients who, are who may have cancer of the breast or already do. Okay, this is the type of equipment that they would be using for that. This is an angiographic suite or interventional suite. There's actually two machines that are used at the same time, one that's coming from the top of the patient, one from the side, so they can take more than one set of ser or one series, more than one series of images at a, at a time. Here's an example of that fancy lead shielding that we get to wear. It comes in a variety of colors, different styles. It's very, you know, they're trying to make them look a little bit more stylish all the time, but they're still lead aprons. They're heavy, but for the most part, we're not wearing them all day, every day. We do take them off in between procedures because you couldn't possibly wear them all day. You would get a sore back. But they do make variations of this. There are styles that have a skirt that wraps all the way around the body as well as a vest. Much easier on your back because you don't have all the weight on your shoulders. An example of the control, bro control booth. So this is the area where the technologist would actually go stand behind the glass to take the picture. And the patients are always like, how come you get to leave and I don't? You know, well, it's because you need to have the radiation to see the pictures in order to get the images. I'm protecting myself on a daily basis by going behind that glass. And then this is just an image of what happens after. After we've taken the images, they get processed by computer, go directly to a, an archival system and a network that we have at the hospital and a server. And then the radiologist can actually pull those images up within minutes to actually view them and make a report. So what are the different areas that you can actually work with it as, as an x-ray tech? Well, there's really about two basic types of environments. There's the hospital, of which there's a variety when it comes down to just the hospital setting, rural hospitals, um, community hospitals within the, within the city, and someplace like the Health Sciences Center, which is a trauma center. So we see a lot of critical cases coming through there. Or a clinic. So a clinic would be you know, if you go to the doctor's office, they give you a requisition, say, go downstairs to the clinic and have a chest x-ray done. That would be your clinic situation, clinic type of environment. So at the hospital, you can see the emergency patients. This is an image of a, patient, of a resuscitation room at, at a site where there's more than one critical patient. And you can see, I don't have a pointer on this, I don't think, do I? I do. Oh, look at that. Sorry, this machine right here, I know it's really small, but... It's an x-ray machine. It's a portable machine that we can bring to the patient and take the images at the bedside so they don't have to come to us when they're that critical. We also have the inpatients, those patients that are in-house in the hospital. They come to us in the department, in the x-ray department, or we go to them. In the hospital, we also see the outpatients that come from clinics within the hospital or off-site. And those I call the walking patients. They're the ones who can walk in the room, pretty much do what you need them to do before, and then they're on their way. And then we also have the special procedures, which I sort of touched base about already. At the medical clinic, they see the outpatient. The walking patient, majority of them can walk in on their own, and it's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of, um, they don't need a lot of assistance, whereas the patients in the hospital need more assistance than the typical walk-in patient. So is every day basically the same? What do you think? No. No day at the hospital or at the clinic is going to be anything the same as the day before. It all depends on the weather. It all depends on, you know, how many parties went on that weekend. Who knows? How many fights broke out at the bar that weekend? Um, there's a lot of different things that can actually take part in how busy we are, what types of patients we see, and um, just how crazy it can get. So it all depends on, and it doesn't matter where you are. You could be at a clinic, you could be at a hospital. Doesn't matter, every day is different. You never know what's gonna walk through the door. So lots of variety. How much of your days were spent working with other people? Well, all day, every day. We work with doctors, we work with the nurses on the wards when we go up to the wards to actually take these images of the patients. And in the department too. We have clerical staff that answer the phones for us and as well as on the wards. We have to talk to them all the time as well colleagues, our own person, our peers within our department, as well as colleagues around, the, around uh, at, at other sites. We also have to be able to, we also deal with the family of the patient, or the patient's family. A lot of times we have to communicate with them. Sometimes it's a language barrier. Sometimes we need them to help us translate what we need the patient to do, like hold their breath. Sounds very simple, 
but not everybody knows what we're talking about when we say that. So we sometimes have to use the family member or we physically will actually show them this is what we want you to do. And of course the patients. We always, those are the most important people we deal with every day. So how do you become an x-ray technologist or how did I become an x-ray technologist? So I'm going to go through some of those education requirements now. Okay? You need grade 12 and you need 27 credits of post-secondary education, whether it's from a, from a college or a university, including statistics, communications, human anatomy and physiology, introdu introduction to physics, introduction to sociology or psychology, and structure and modeling in chemistry. Okay, so those are prerequisite courses to be taken prior to coming into the x-ray program at Red River. The program itself is a 20-month diploma program at Red River College. It has an August or September start date, depending on where the long weekend falls. Okay. And it's eight months at Red River, so you're going from September to April at Red River College. And then starting in May, you do a 12-month clinical rotation at a base site. In Winnipeg, the base sites are the Health Sciences Center, St. Boniface, Seven Oaks, the Victoria General, the Grace. I think I got all of them. Rural hospital, rural, um, did I say Seven Oaks? Yes, yeah, sorry. Just thought I might not have said it. Uh, Brandon in rural Manitoba, as well as a lot of other rural sites. Selkirk, Steinbeck, um, Portage La Prairie, Dauphin, Boundary Trails, which is out by Warren. Um, so there's a lot of different areas that you can actually, a lot of different sites that you can go to for your 12-month clinical rotation. Once you're finished and you've completed the program and passed everything and you've graduated, it's all hap you have to take a national certification exam through our national association in order to practice in Canada. You can't just graduate from the program and go on to become an x-ray tech in a department. You have to pass this national exam. It's a four-hour exam that you write post-graduation and it's once you've passed that, then you become certified and you can work as a technologist anywhere in Canada. Okay. And then in Manitoba, you do automatically become registered with the MAMRT, which is our provincial association, and the CAMRT, which is our national association. So you would be at the Notre Dame campus um, here in Winnipeg. The start date, the next start date that they're taking applications for, as far as I know right now, as per the website, because this is where I got it from, is August 31st, 2015. So there is a bit of a wait list. Costs, and these again are estimates. Year one and year two are the same. It's 37.24 for both years. Okay, so 3,724. The books and supplies are $2,800, but those books apply to both years. It's not, I need $2,800 worth of books in year one, and I need another $2,800 worth of books in year two. They apply to both. Okay, so you use the same books all the way through. Other fees. Year one, there's a $200 fee for uniforms because you do wear scrubs when you're working as an x-ray tech and as a student. And year two, there's that CAMRT national exam does have a cost. It's a big one, it's $900. So you only wanna write it once. You get four chances. If you don't pass it the first time, you have four chances to write it, but you only wanna write it once because it's $900 a pop. So every time you go to write, it's another $900. Why is it so expensive? I know someone always wants to ask. Because we actually pull people from across the country into Ottawa once a year to write these exams. I'm one of those people. So um, it is a big cost involved through the National Association to do that. And the books purchased, again, like I said, in year one will be used in both years. As well, the, our, the DSM, or the Diagnostic Services of Manitoba, also has an education sponsorship and return of service program that they offer to students who are willing to work in a rural site once they leave the program. This only applies to the rural sites, so Thompson, Churchill, um, places you know, outside of the perimeter of Winnipeg. So those seeking admission to Red River uh, may be eligible to receive financial assistance through DSM, through their education sponsorship and return of service program for those rural northern Manitoba. Accepted students will receive a reimbursement for tuition and books for the two-year diploma program, which is approximately that $8,500 provide any additional cross-training, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, that is required and guarantee full-time employment upon completion of the program in exchange for a three-year return of service commitment in a rural or northern facility. So this is definitely an option. If it is something that you're considering coming into, is coming into x-ray, and this is looking you know, very nice, 
to you and you're okay with working in a rural community out, um, after you graduate, you can definitely visit DSM's website and you will be able to get all the information from there. Um, the cross-training that's mentioned in there, a lot of the sites are so small that they don't always have a laboratory technologist and an x-ray technologist at the same time working there just because of staffing. So what they do is they do cross-train x-ray technologists to do very basic lab tests and lab technologists to do very basic x-ray exams so that they can have one person who can stay there and do both jobs at the same time. Okay? So that is where that cross-training comes in. It's only offered through, um, through DSM though. Okay. Working conditions, the hours of work, hospital, it's shift work. Monday to, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. They don't close. Okay. Clinics is a Monday to Friday job. It's the cushy one. So some people like the clinic because of the pace and because of the hours. Someone like myself, I like the hospital because of the pace. Not really because of the hours. When I used to work nights, it wasn't always the greatest thing, but I like it because of the pace. Dress code, scrubs. Okay, so the scrub pants and scrub tops. Duty shoes or anything that's closed, toe. You don't want to be wearing any open toe shoes at the hospital because someone could drive over your foot with a wheelchair, drive over your foot with a stretcher, patient could fall on you, whatever. Okay. Physical demands, be physically fit and, good, and use good body mechanics. That's about the number one thing is that body mechanics are key in this, in this job, that we're using our, our legs and backs properly so that we're not hurting ourselves. There's lots of patient transferring. We have to move patients from the stretcher to our x-ray table. Um, we have to assist patients from, stand, from sitting into a standing position out of a wheelchair. We have to assist them from the wheelchair to sit on the table and lie down. So there's a lot of, there is a lot of physical involvement with the job. As well, when we go to move the equipment, a lot of the equipment that we move is above our head. So we have to be able to work in that, in that um, extension of our arms as well. Okay. Benefits, very quickly. Pension plans, they are available through the hospitals if you're working with WRHA or DSM. And clinics is depending on the, on the employer. Salary scales, most of the members of the hospitals are unionized, so we all have a contract that we, are, uh, that we go by when it comes to wages. But a, a new graduate usually starts at around $25 an hour. And depending on where you go on advancement, you could increase to close to 40 okay. over the years. Clinics, it's dependent on where you're working, who your employer is, but for the most part, they tend to be very comparable to the hospitals because they need the staff as well. They know that if they don't pay comparable, they're, you're going to go somewhere else. Okay. How do you apply for a job and how does it work? Well, through the WRHA, their listings are on their website. Preference is given usually, though, to internal applicants. So depending on what job is being posted, sometimes people within the site might be applying for that same job. So if there is an internal applicant, typically they will look at them first. But that doesn't mean that that job necessarily will be given to them. They will definitely be looking at them first, though, because of union, seniority, etc. cetera. Okay. Clinics, they usually post everything online or in the newspaper. And again, it's just a call for an interview from the employer. And DSM or rural Manitoba also post their jobs online, but they also have internal applicants as well because a lot of them are unionized. What are they looking for? Good communication skills. You have to be able to talk to people on a professional level. Patients, doctors, nurses, other x-ray technologists, other people that are working in the healthcare system. Personable, good personality. Because again, you're dealing with the sick. A lot of those patients are very, very ill and we have to be able to give them that comfort when they're there. Continuing education, are you showing your employer that you're going to be continuing your education? Are there other courses you can take to better yourself as a technologist? They do look for that. Physically fit, are you going to be able to handle the physical uh, attributes to the job? Do you have a strong knowledge base? There are some employers who actually quiz people who are applying for the jobs on how to take x-rays. When you look at the images, how do you tell if it's good or not? Um, there are some employers who do, a lot of them actually, who do quiz you on that type of information. Critical thinking skills. Can you think your way out of a problem? If you have a patient who's on the table who all of a sudden is turning, is going downhill is the word I'll use, but if they start to take a turn for the worse, how do you, what do you do? Okay. Able to handle high stress situations. And I put that in there because I work in a facility that can be that way. Health Sciences Centre is a trauma centre. We see, like I said, a lot of that trauma that you hear about on the news, car accidents, 
you know, stabbings, those types of situations. We see a lot of it at the Health Sciences Center. Not to say they don't see it at the other sites, but we see a lot of it at our site. And they can be high stress situations. We could be involved in that situation. So are you able to be in that type of an environment? Where can you go after x-ray? Well, I've kind of touched base on some of this already. X-ray, you can move into CT. You can move into mammography. Those two areas have extra courses that our National Association does offer in order to become better educated in those areas to perform them. That doesn't mean that you can't get a job without the courses, but they do recommend that you do take those courses while you're learning and being employed by that area. You can also move into angiography, which is the, the area that I described about the, that visualizes the vessels of the body. Management, okay, there's always that move into management. Instruction, which is where I am now. Red River College needs instructors, you know, and those ones that are there get old and they retire and then someone has to fill their shoes. Or I retire someone. I already have one guy at work though who's told me a million times he wants my job. He told me he's going to have to wait a long time yet. Sales rep. There's a lot of students that do go out of x-rays directly into sales. They're selling the x-ray equipment. Some of them are computer techie guys or girls or women, whatever, and they go, that's, they, they definitely want to sell that type of equipment, so they're, they're big into that. Radiation safety, we have a, se a section at the hospital that is radiation safety. They tell us how to be safe or make sure we are being safe. MRI and ultrasound are a different color because you do need to take extra an extra course or an extra program to actually get into those fields. Ultrasound is an 18-month program outside of x-ray, and MRI is a nine-month program outside of x-ray. There's also nuclear medicine and radiation therapy, which are also fall under the MAMRT, which are other modalities that you can take uh, courses in. You don't need x-ray to get into them. They are separate, completely separate. But x-ray itself is recognized by the Canadian Armed Forces. So you could actually go and work in the Army or with the Armed Forces as an x-ray technologist. They need them out in the, in the different um, war zones so to speak. If they have injuries, they do have x-ray equipment on site where they can actually image the soldiers. You could also become, go into quality testing and industry. They do a lot of imaging of air, air, uh, airplane engines to make sure that they are safe. I don't know a lot about that, but I know that they do use x-ray to image the engines. <clears throat> Qualities and abilities, what are needed for someone starting out? Well, I kind of touched a little bit on what is expected of a person who's coming into a job. Good communication skills. You're personable. Um, I always like to use the word empathy, that you have empathy for your patient. So you are always aware of how they're feeling, okay? Um, able to handle those stressful situations. Uh, critical thinking skills. A lot of different, and in, um, part, sorry, in your present position, my position that I'm in now, I know, me personally, I need patience because the students are coming to me from Red River College. They've learned everything out of the book, but as you, they are quick to find out that every patient that walks in the door is not a textbook patient. They might not be able to do exactly what the book has told them to do, so it's my job to teach them how to think outside the box. Okay, so I need patience in my job so they learn how to work with patients. And what is, is it nece what is necessary in the future? Well, I think everything is necessary, what I've already mentioned, and I don't think anything would change. Do I have experience in other occupations or volunteer positions? Well, I'll admit, I worked in the retail sector for a while when I was a teenager. I worked at Canadian Tire for five years when I was in high school. I have to admit, working in retail definitely helps because you learn how to work with people, how to work with management how to deal with customers, which actually is sort of can take it into being working with patients, because really they are a customer. We don't call them that, but that's really what they are. Okay. I also used to teach Ukrainian dance for many, many years, ages five and up to 40, I don't know. But just dealing with different ages of people, because we do have the children's hospital as well, pediatrics. So learning how to deal with kids, different personalities, how to resolve conflict, when you've got two kids in your group that don't want to dance together or talk to each other, well, guess what? I've got two students over here who don't want to talk to each other or work together either. So it's helped me in that regard. What changes have I seen? It's dramatic. The changes that have happened in the last five to ten years in radiology alone are huge. We've gone from processing film 
which is taking that hard copy, putting it through the machine, going through all the different chemicals, through the drying station, and coming out on the other side so that we can put it up on a view box to look at. We don't do that anymore. It's gone. We're all digital. This is an example of one of the rooms we have at the Health Sciences Center. It's a digital room. There's no film. Nothing. Everything's in, within the system itself. And within minutes after taking the, or actually it's not even minutes, it's seconds after taking your exposure, you've got an image coming up on the screen. So much faster, so much quicker to put patients through. But again, it's a computer. There are many days I wish I could go back to the old way of doing things because it, it didn't break down as often as the computer does. But it definitely, we are moving forward. CT is constantly changing. We can't keep up. MRI is the same. They're always thinking of different ways, newer ways, less dose to the patient, safer. It's constantly, constantly changing. So where would I see us in the next five years? I really don't know. For example, we have an MRI unit right now at the Health Sciences. It's one of the only ones in North America, let alone the world, that actually can move. It's an MRI unit that can move between three separate rooms it can be in an angiography suite, which is where we do the vessel imaging. It can be on its own just to do general imaging. And it can also move into an OR suite. So it can also be used in the operating room. They're just starting to use it now. So it's innovative, but by the time we got it in, there's already a new one out on the market. So everything is changing constantly. Will demand for workers increase or decrease? Well, we're getting into that stage now where the baby boomers are slowly starting to walk out and retire. So yes, the jobs are becoming more, there are more jobs coming up in the next, I would say, five years. But like any other profession, we go through uh, peaks and valleys. It goes up and down. So I really, it's hard to say in the future what's going to happen. Our hospital is expanding constantly. So we might have more jobs available in the next five to ten years just from expansion alone. So it's really hard to say. And what advice do I give, or would I give to a person considering this occupation? Pursuing a career is significant investment of time and money. So really investigate whether this is what you want to do. Okay? Research the career to ensure it matches your goals and values. And also realistically assess your strengths and weaknesses to determine if it fits. Do you like working with people? Are you okay with working with the sick? Because if you, that's key. You have to be able to work with sick people. Okay? And arrange time to job shadow an x-ray technologist. If you're from a high school, go to your guidance counselor. If you're interested in coming for a job shadow, let them know. I do it all the time. I have students coming from a different high schools that come and job shadow one of our techs, or I take them around the department and get them to kind of see what we really do. It's one thing to listen to me talk and tell you what I do on a daily basis, but something completely different to actually see it in action. So I highly recommend that. Why did I choose this occupation? And why am I still here? Well, I like working with people. I always have. I'm a talker. I like to talk all the time. And um, I love, I always wanted to be in the medical field. But I didn't want to be a doctor. I didn't want to put in the hours. And I didn't want to be a nurse. So I went looking. And this is what I found. I thought, oh, hey, it's x-rays. Those are kind of cool, taking pictures of bones and other stuff. But once I got into the program and I actually got onto the floor and I'm working with patients and talking to people and, and um, dealing with in that type of an environment, I really love it. I do. I can't say that I don't love my job. I love caring for people and that's, and that's to me, I like being part of the solution to the problem. And that's really what you are. You are part of the solution to the problem. That patient has something wrong, you are part of the solution to how they're going to get cared for to make them better.